Hello once again, this is Professor Lusheen with Lecture 23 for Safety 388 Introduction to Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, this is, we're going to cover respiratory protection here in conservation programs. And on the screen here you see two pictures and I put them on here without really thinking what you might be impressed by them. And so the one on the left is not someone in an outhouse. That's actually the door is supposed to be closed. That's a soundproof booth to do audiometric testing. The person wears headphones and then a, they usually have some sort of a trigger or something to let the person know uh, whether they hear certain frequencies at certain amplitudes. On the right, uh, no, that's, that's not, she's not trying to kill her. She's actually doing a qualitative fit test for an air purifying respirator. So she's wearing a hood and then she's injecting some sort of, um, uh, what do you want to call it? A contaminant, air contaminant, could be saccharin, which is sweet, could be banana oil, which you can smell the banana oil, or it could be nuisance dust. They're all right around like a 2.5 micron diameter. Uh, and so that's, that's how you test whether it's fit, fitting properly. And the person has to let you know whether they can taste or smell those substances. So I'm gonna go really quickly over the OSHA requirements. Uh, if you'll recall, respiratory protection was the number three most frequently cited standard in the fiscal year 2020. Number two, if we we're just looking at general industry. Uh, but hearing conservation is also a very common um, concern and program that companies must have. And that's cited a lot too. Um, it, I mean, the thing is, we talked about, in the previous two lectures, we talked about health standards, we talked about chemical safety and training, we talked about industrial hygiene and other forms of health hazards. And so for respiratory protection here in conservation, you really need a certified industrial hygienist to assess what the worker exposure is. So it's a medical record of what they're exposed to at work, therefore you select the proper PPE to protect the workers. Recalling that personal protective equipment is actually the lowest form of protection. Um, it'd be better if you could engineer it out or replace it with something else. So respiratory disease is a fairly common thing in the US population, whether it's actual uh, lung damage that can occur through life choices um, or actual you know, damage that can be done by exposures at work. The thing is, we can't breathe we die, uh, and so it's really important that we keep our lungs as healthy as possible, therefore protect our lungs from airborne contaminants that can uh, damage, destroy. Um, as you can see um, on the bottom here, I've got some numbers as far as how much it costs you know, overall. So the primary concerns with lung disease are lung cancer. So silico silica can cause silicosis, asbestos can, can cause asbestosis, uh, but you can also develop uh, chemical-induced uh, asthma, in which the bronchioles react to certain chemical, you get sensitized to it. There is a COPD, and there's also then lung disease. And you can see how they kind of lay out there that um, yeah, things that you get exposed to at work can actually cause you, you know, a permanent uh, disability, lung damage. We typically think about exposures from the particulate perspective. I got dusts. Um, and then that's, that's a pretty common one. Uh, mists, so it's going to be tiny liquid droplets. Fumes is after something's been combusted. Uh, vapor tends to be the, you know, the vapor is the you know, version of a, of a liquid that's been vaporized. And then a gas is something that at room temperature is in fact a gas. And they tend to travel through the air with different principles. Some have drag, some have, some are more responsive to gra gravity metric forces. Uh, some are stickier or may even be electrically charged. They may adhere to things. And so knowing all these things, it allows us to have a better idea of how they may pass from its generation to the breathing zone of people and whether um, our natural uh, protections, our respiratory protections can handle it. And so uh, you see here, so it can come in through the sinuses, come in through the mouth. Uh, we do have natural defenses, uh, the back of our throat. So if we have a dust or a particulate or a fume that can actually impact the back of our throat because we have little hairs there that are actually pushing up saliva or um, mucus and things can entrap on that and then we either expectorate it, huck it up, or we swallow it and we, di we, di we can ingest it. Uh, but if, if something's too small that it bypasses it or if you are a smoker, or if you're breathing in a very low humidity or zero humidity environment, what that can do is 
either um, like smoking damages the actual um, filtration in our throat, uh, numbs it, whereas dry air can uh, make the mucus not as sticky, so therefore things can pass by, um, and things can get into our lungs, and either it can infect the lungs or possibly pass over the uh, the membranes within the, what are the smallest things called again? Alveoli, and actually pass into our bloodstream. So that's typically more of the gaseous vapor level. The fumes usually end up stay in the lungs themselves. So definitely check out the uh, respiratory protection page on the OSHA website. There's a lot of great information there. As I mentioned with industrial hygiene, there is no instrument such as you see on Star Trek or Doctor Who where you can walk into a room, turn it on, and it tells you what is there, at what concentrations, and everything like that. You need someone who's trained in the, the arts of industrial hygiene. And yes, we do prescribe the use of respiratory protection. I'm more of a ventilation design guy. So I like to try and um, confine and ventilate airborne hazards if at all possible. But I also know how to do all the respiratory stuff too. The thing is with respiratory protection is it is, you're using the, uh, the negative pressure of your lungs to pull air through a filter device. Now it's either a solid state or a chemically treated uh, substance which will allow gases or vapors to adhere to it. But we tend to think of it more of a, of a filter, which is more of a mechanical and uh, what do they call it, entrapment, encapsulation, something like that, um, impaction, that's what it is, in order to prevent those things from getting to you know, our mouth and into our lungs. So it's putting extra resistance to our respiratory system. Therefore, that also increases the stress on our cardiovascular system. So if you have a pre-existing cardiovascular condition, it can exacerbate it or trigger some sort of um, disease-like response, which can be dangerous. So if you're going to be required to wear a respirator, and I, what I like to say, call it is an air purifying respirator, APR, uh, you have to go get tested. Uh, you go to the doctor, you fill a survey, they do a pulmonary function test, which you're going to be able to watch a video on. It's not fun. Uh, basically, you, you blow into a tube because what they're doing is they're assessing your uh, lung capacity and your ability to um, basically you know, exhale. Do, you, do, do the lungs have the capacity and the strength to handle that kind of stress? Because typically when you're wearing these masks, you're doing other work. So you're also being... Um, uh, physical, laborious, while you're wearing these things, and that is hurting, affecting your breathing. So when all this stuff came out with the use of face masks, we're like, oh, I can't breathe. Dude, people have been wearing respirators for a long time, and you have to be tested for it, and there's, there's things you can do. Um, and there's a lot to training the worker on the limitations of it, how to care for it, clean it, store it properly, how to wear it, make sure that it's fitting properly, because a respirator must have a seal. So I would not be able to wear a respirator or a purifying respirator because I've got a beard. Um, I could wear a um, powered air purifying respirator, which is a more of a hood, which has a pump that's usually attached to my belt in the back that pulls the air in and then forces it. So the, the, the hood itself is under positive pressure constantly so that nothing can actually seep in. And sometimes you see those on the news. You'll see uh, emergency room um, workers wearing a almost either, it almost looks like a, a scuba mask, almost full face mask. And they've got tubes going down the back. Those are powered air purifying respirators. The filters are actually on the pump itself. Um, but you've probably also seen people wear airlines, which is a full face respirator, which a line goes to uh, an air pump or compressor, but not a, not a typical per, 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 compressor your dad has in, your, in their garage. Uh, it's a special kind. Uh, or an SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus. Not underwater, uh, but that you, you see like firefighters. What they're doing is you're bringing your own breathable atmosphere with you, so you're not relying on the breathable atmosphere. So that's why you have to assess the air or the environment that people are going to be in as far as do, do they have to be supplied with breathable air or can they filter the air that's in their environment. And yeah, I think I covered all that stuff.
So I talked about confinement and ventilation. That's the best way to go. It's difficult. Um, I mean, as an engineer, I, I can do the calculations because I can study or create simulations of how um, the whatever I'm studying, whatever air contaminant I'm studying, how it migrates through the air. It's it's either resistance or um, how it uh, travels through. Um, Airflow and how it can be captured and removed. It's not. It's not that simple. Uh, you know the design of a ventilation system, the ductwork. There's pressure drop, static pressure drop as it moves through. Um, it can create static charges that things can adhere to, and there are all kinds of different types of filtration that go well beyond filter media. You know, there's electrostatic. Um, there's flares. There's cyclonic. There's a lot of different ways you can remove things from air streams, and you got to choose the correct one based on, you know, first of all, economics, but mostly uh, what level of uh, filtration efficiency you need. So let's talk a little bit about face coverings versus respirators. What's interesting is on this week's reflection assignment, I uh, I have a question that I've had for several years. So years before the pandemic. Uh, do face masks, are they respirators? No, they are not. They're not tight fitting. They're not designed in order to have a filter efficiency. Um, and they're not really designed for anything but a covering. So what, what these coverings basically do is they catch water droplets from that you're, that you're expelling. And it's also uh, somewhat dampening your breathing airflow. So as you breathe out, it goes out straight ahead of you. When you're breathing into a mask, it, um, it forces it to go vertical. So it doesn't expel out. Um, but and again, it, it tends to catch uh, droplets. Um, so when you have two people wearing them, so they're not breathing at each other. So therefore, they're not exchanging air that has just come out of their their lungs but more or less it's catching the big particulate I'm sorry the big water droplets and it's forcing the air to mitigate adjacently from their from their face which means it's you know going up and down and sideways versus right at them so there's a protection factor uh, based on that so it's a it's a it's an airflow redirection and possibly the capture of sputum that we naturally breathe out or cough uh, sometimes when we yell or breathe heavier, we can expel more things from our lungs because the lungs are a pump in many, in many ways. Over on the right, I have a, the basic premise of an N95 respirator. N95 being uh, its only designated, N basically no oil <laughs> is what N stands for. 95 is 95% 95 efficient at uh, 2.5 microns or below. And a micron is very small. It's 10 to the minus sixth of a meter. And um, the human hair is about, I don't have any, <laughs> the human hair is about 50 microns wide. So you probably can't see these particulates uh, unless they're, they, you know, you know, had some static connection and they get larger. Then they tend to be more susceptible to gravitometric or float down. Otherwise, they travel through the air like a gas or a vapor. We call that Brownian motion. Uh, it's kind of just, it's a, sort of a random. Um, and then therefore, when you apply a cross airflow, um, it will grab and be migrated towards it. So face coverings are not respirators, not at all, but they do serve a purpose in protecting each other from our own um, exhalation of air. Now, I've, I've been reading about what I was gonna talk about with this and with ventilation. So I, yeah, I consider myself a ventilation expert. Um, I've got my PE license, professional engineer, along with being a CIH. So it is in my, definitely in my wheelhouse. And the types of ventilation systems I've designed is try to capture something as it's been generated, whether it's gaseous, particulate, or fume. It's difficult to do. It really is difficult because you have to have something called capture velocity which um, isn't general room ventilation at all. It's, it's, it's focused, it's like, you know, point, and it has to be able to, the airflow that you're generating towards that point 
it actually has to pass through. First of all, it has to pass through it. And once it gets into there, is it enough to draw it in so that it can be expelled from the room or the environment or whatever? General room ventilation is for heating and cooling and humidification control. If anything, it's meant for the mitigation of carbon dioxide, which is what we expel. So when I read these experts saying, oh, you know, we need special filters and uh, we need really good room ventilation, I, I'm not buying it. Um, it's, and, and the pictures they draw is, well, if you're upstream and, and somebody downstream is sick, it won't travel back to you. Agreed. But how many rooms are perfectly designed so it has 100, com you know, 100 percent complete air exchange every few minutes? I, 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 I studied flammable liquid storage rooms, and those do an okay job, and those are specifically designed for the for the capture and removal of flammable liquids. I've studied spray booths, and again. <laughs> General human movement and obstructions create air current eddies, and those eddies capture things and they redistribute contaminants. So when people tell me, oh, we just need these MERV 13 filters and to increase airflow in a room, I'm not buying it. And that's my professional opinion. I'm gonna get off my soapbox, I could talk for hours. So there are different forms of respiratory protection. I really could have gone on and on for a long time. What we have here is at the, the top, you see the purple? Purple is de designated to any particulate. You can see here down on the bottom, it, it, there's, that's the NIOSH. NIOSH certifies respirators and the cartridges. So we have a half face and we have a full face. Uh, full face has a better protection factor, better seal. It also protects the eyes um, along with the, the respiratory. So you use those for higher protection. It's also more claustrophobic and there are other issues. And so half face is probably the more common that you'll see. So you have to know when to change out these cartridges. You have to choose the cartridges correctly to protect you from the air contaminants. And that requires a certified industrial hygienist. Uh, just down there, that's the, it's a full face powered air purifying. Uh, so it, it is for particulate. So it's a full face mask and the pump pulls the air through the filter and feeds it to the matte face mask. That may actually be pressure demand so it kind of saves on energy. Over on the left, those are, those are loose fitting. One is a, just a face piece with a hat, the other is a hood. So that, in that, whenever you breathe in, um, the pressure has to be higher than that, forcing air in so that um, nothing can slip in. And so that, that's constantly running. On the very bottom, that's, a air pure, that's, a, that's, sorry, that's an air supply hood. Uh, right here, bottom, uh, middle, that's a, uh, SCBA or self-contained breathing apparatus. So you bring the air with you. And then over on the right, we have the N95s, or these are actual just you know, air purifying respirators, half face, um, but they are specially designed. The thing is, you know, people are just wearing fabric, you know. The thing is what you want is a substance that is randomly cross-linked like this, so the particulate can't just go straight through. There is, it's no Swiss cheese. It's Something is impacting it, both in and out. And then you've got this person here going through a pulmonary function test. Not fun. I've gone through them. Okay, we're going to switch gears now to hearing loss. Um, this is something that you should be able to protect. The thing is, you know, our leisure activities are also a threat. And so I think this is something that should really train us when we're in junior high, high school. I guess you call it middle school here that um, noise is above 90 decibels for lengths of time. And as, the, as you go up in decibel amount, even lower in lengths of time, uh, you can do permanent damage to the anatomy of the ear and it will not recover. You will lose the ability to hear that frequency um, or you have to increase the amplitude of the signal in order to make sense of it. Uh, and we rely really heavily on sound um, in order to function. Um, right behind vision, sound is our second most important um, sensing organ. In the OSHA standards, they tell you what the limits are for an eight-hour period. Uh, but 
you know, we spend more than eight hours outside of the workplace. The most important number is the 140. Above 140, one shot of 140, and usually it is like a boom, uh, you can, you can um, incur permanent hearing damage. Otherwise, it's higher levels over a period of time, so it's cumulative. Uh, basically, what happens is the, 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 the cilia in the ear get damaged. So over on the right here, so we've got the anatomy of the ear. Um, and so pressure, sound pressure waves from the environment impact this membrane and cause, this is called the hammer and the anvil, to react and therefore it sends a signal through the semicircular canals which then makes sense of what that noise is. And then that is turned into a, um, a uh, signal to the brain and the brain makes sense of it through the cochlear nerve. Also important in the ear is the vestibular nerve. This is what gives us a sense of balance. Also, it's what gives us motion sickness because if we're sensing motion, um, no, here's the thing, if we're not sensing motion but the ear is feeling it, that's, that imbalance is where we get motion sickness. So motion sickness is tied to um, our ear canal. So you know, sometimes when you get dizzy, when you're ill, it's usually due to some sort of congestion or you know, you head congestion, which, um, which kind of just affects the vestibular nerve and our ears. Um, it's all connected. So if you've ever had you know, dizzy spells, the doctor tends to treat it with like an antihistamine or, or something to clear you, clear you out. So within the, the shell here, there are little hairs, they're called cilia. And um, they're the ones that are really, they, they do all the work. They're the ones that are really turning the, the pressure sensing to a electronic signal, which goes to the brain. And heavy noise or, or exposure to long periods of noise, they lay down and they never recover. And some of us, like I have something called tinnitus, uh, because when I was in high school, um, I wore headphones and I was listening to the Beastie Boys while I was mowing the lawn, so I had to crank. I kept one off so I could hear people if they were yelling at me. So I kept one on, so I blasted that one um, to make up the, make, you know, to overpower the sound of the lawnmower. And so now I have constant ringing in this ear, um, just in this ear, which is really weird, but that's why, because I was blasting the Beastie Boys. I regret nothing. <laughs> All right, so and <laughs> this gives you a little bit of information about the physics of sound. Um, these are the um, the relative response lines for frequency. Dogs tend to hear, I believe, at an A level. I think we are at a C level, so we can't hear the entire range like dogs do. Uh, but we're limited to it. But then also we can expo we can be exposed to frequencies outside of our um, hearing range, which can also do damage. So we got to be careful. Hearing conservation program, what they do is they're assessing what the possible noise levels are at work and then either mitigating what those exposures are or providing hearing protection. Hearing protection being the easiest, but the problem is, you know, the, the plugs, the ones you roll and put in your, people don't wear them properly, they don't insert them far enough. Um, all that can then make it, make them susceptible to noise. On the bottom, this gentleman here is using a sound level meter with um, this, the foam is just wind, uh, wind control. Person on the bottom, they're in a soundproof booth and they're being tested. This, I, I provided a bunch of videos both for this lecture that you can go on and see more information how it's actually done. Um, you know, you have earmuffs, you've got the plugs, you've got custom plugs. Uh, you can use a combination of both, though it's not additive as far as the protection. There's only a factor. But now we also have noise-canceling headphones, which is an interesting new tool in our arsenal. I wear noise-reducing re noise re noise headphones when I mow the lawn now and can barely hear the lawnmower running, and I can play my music at a lower level. And that's, I think that's a great option. And then they're comfortable, too. I don't mind them. Uh, let's see. So any, any workplace that, provide, that exposes workers to at or above 85 decibels in an eight hour period um, is they have to have a hearing conservation program. So by controlling noise, you may be able to mitigate that extra expense. Of course, that comes along with training and everything else. 
Here's ways that you can deaden noise. The problem is if you're deadening noise of something that gives off heat, you don't want to contain the heat because that is a secondary issue. So you can use things like you know muffler chambers or you know robots do things that are really loud. All these things can help reduce the spread of, of noise. So I covered a lot of things, but I also provided you with a lot of links to check out, um, either through the NASH website or the OSHA website, and a bunch of cool videos. And I'm going to have you test your noise. <laughs> I'm an old guy, and I listen to loud music, and so my hearing is horrible. So when I've done the test before, when I set this up, my kids are like, on the other side of the house, they're like, Dad, what are you doing? And I'm like, what? I can't hear anything. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Anyway, uh, so also read Chapter 7. Check out some of the, the, also the additional readings I provided to you. And again, the study sheets are always meant to help you prepare for the quiz.